Hello and good morning. My name is Andrew Ayers and I'm a research fellow with the, in the Water Policy Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. Thanks for tuning in to our program today, featuring the findings of a new PPIC report, Water, Land Use and Growth in the San Joaquin Valley. First, we would like to thank our funders of this work, the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the California Home Building Foundation, California Water Service, and the Water Funder Initiative Water Campaign. We appreciate their support for this research and today's event. The report, as well as the slides from today's presentation are available on our website at ppic.org. And one important reminder is that PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. For today's program, I will first present some key findings from the report. Then I'll hand over the program to my colleague and one of our co-authors, Ellen Hammack, to moderate a discussion with a really great panel of experts. And finally, we have set aside some time at the end of the program for audience Q&A. If you have questions for that Q&A session, you can submit them at ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. We would appreciate you including your name and organization along with the, your question because it's nice to be able to attribute them to polls. And with that, I'll begin uh, the presentation. So today I'm, I'm excited to be able to present some of the results from this recent report uh, that's been done with a, a great group of co-authors and is in many ways partially a data-driven exercise where we've used uh, uh, novel, some publicly available and, and some more detailed data on urban utilities from the San Joaquin Valley to better understand their supply and demand planning trajectories. And this has also been informed with uh, a set of focus groups from large urban utilities, smaller utilities, land use authorities, and others. Much of the discussion around the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in the Valley focuses on agriculture. And that makes sense because agriculture is a key player in Sigma implementation in the Valley. Urban areas, although they use much less water, oftentimes are highly reliant on groundwater. So Sigma implementation is very important for them as well. Some things that are different between agriculture and urban in this context is that for urban users, reliable long-term supplies really are essential. In many ways, it's not just a matter of needing to have water to fuel development, but there's oftentimes a, a legal obligation to demonstrate reliable supplies before development can even happen. As a result, basin-wide management to stabilize groundwater tables and sustainably manage the resource is in some ways more, more urgent for urban users than it is for agriculture. The map on the, on the left-hand part of the slide demonstrates how in many ways urban, develop, urban settlements within the valley are in, in some ways islands in a sea of agriculture, but it also really highlights how managing groundwater in this region is going to, despite tensions, require partnerships between urban and agriculture and some other players in the valley. Now, I mentioned that urban areas are highly reliant on groundwater here, and we can see that um, by looking at data from the 2015 urban water management plans. This is plotted in a map on the left-hand side of your screen right now. There's one circle on this map for each one of the 48 urban water suppliers that we identified in the valley. The circles are sized by population served and the color indicates what extent, to what extent their uh, water supply portfolio depends on groundwater. The red circles are nearly or entirely dependent on groundwater while yellow, green, or blue have more surface water uh, in their portfolio. The first thing to notice is that those utilities that are entirely dependent on groundwater are spread throughout the valley, but also that groundwater reliance really is sort of a matter of scale. 
Smaller and many mid-sized utilities are entirely reliant on groundwater, but it's only when uh, a utility is a little bit bigger that they're able to, bring, to have the scale to bring in access and treat surface water and bring it into their portfolio. Those that are entirely reliant on groundwater are going to face different challenges uh, in Sigma implementation moving forward. One thing that we were also able to look at with the urban water management plan data is how this groundwater reliance was expected to develop in the future. And so that's plotted on the right-hand side of your screen now. Those plotted in red were planning to basically keep keep their portfolio share pretty much the same, while those in blue were planning to bring in more surface water or other supplies uh, in order to, to diversify their portfolio away from groundwater. One key thing to notice is that many of those, especially the smaller utilities that were entirely reliant on groundwater expected to stay entirely reliant on groundwater. There are a few exceptions though, especially in the northern part of the valley up near Modesto where some smaller utilities are planning to bring surface water into their portfolio through regional partnerships. And right now I'll take a moment to highlight two utilities in particular, Clovis and Arvin. These are representative of sort of a mid-sized utility, Clovis serving about 100, slightly over 100,000 residents with some surface water in its portfolio and Arvin, uh, a much smaller utility serving uh, on the order of 20 to 30,000 residents with that is entirely dependent on groundwater. Now on the panel later, we're gonna have representatives from both of those utilities um, answering questions and engaging in a discussion. So look forward to that. But utilities uh, moving forward with Sigma implementation are going to have to manage not just the supply side, but also the demand side. So water use in the Valley generally outpaces the statewide average on a per capita basis, but it has been declining recently. On the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see a similar map uh, to previous slides, but this time showing the per capita water use for each one of the 48 uh, utilities that we identified in the Valley. You'll see that the regional average of about 184 gallons per person per day lies above the statewide average. Part of this can be attributed to uh, high outdoor use, especially in the Southern portions of the Valley. And in the report, we go into a little bit of detail about how we were able to measure uh, outdoor use. But this represents an opportunity for continued progress on water use efficiency, reducing that high outdoor use. Something else that's relatively new in many parts of the Valley is metering. And this can drive progress, not just by communicating to residents how much water they're using, um, but also by allowing for new, new pricing approaches um, that can help tamper demand. Um, another reason that water use is high in the Valley is that water prices have been and generally still are quite low in statewide comparison. But in thinking more about pricing as a, as a mechanism to control demand, we need to remember that in the San Joaquin Valley, sometimes low incomes can also cue affordability concerns. Now, the new 2020 urban water management plans so show some progress in terms of incorporating and being cognizant of upcoming Sigma restrictions in supply and demand planning, but more integration is needed. And moreover, uh, we also looked at the actions that um, urban utilities are planning in their groundwater sustainability plans under Sigma to help bring basins into balance. And they show uh, some need for additional partnerships that we think can be very important in helping these utilities not only resolve their own supply and demand issues, but also bring basins into balance more generally. And so we can describe some of those key partnerships here briefly. Um, the first will be partnerships on recharge and land use, land use decisions and management. So these really are partnerships between urban utilities and agriculture and local land use authorities. Um, to both identify areas that might be particularly good for recharge to help increase groundwater supply um, and protect those areas, but also really just get the water in the ground. So in particular, urban uh, agriculture some, can sometimes bring water to the table and urban utilities can sometimes bring, bring funding and other capacity to make recharge projects happen. Uh, 
Models already exist in the valley. So for example, on the right-hand side of this screen, there is a, a picture of Fresno's Leaky Acres recharge site where water is delivered through Fresno Irrigation District infrastructure, but recharged for the general benefit of groundwater conditions in the area. It's important for urban utilities to lean in and, and help plan uh, more activities like this. The second type of partnership that we think will be important is water trading. So these are partnerships between urban utilities and local agriculture to sometimes where, where necessary, reallocate some water from agricultural use to urban use, especially as Sigma um, brings new constraints on groundwater pumping. Um, and really urban utilities can build on historical successes in the Valley here. For many years, there have been trades between agricultural and urban, either on a short-term basis during drought or on a longer term basis to accommodate new growth. And the final sort of partnership that we highlight in the report are partnerships between urban utilities and other smaller communities um, who oftentimes, or most of the time really, are very highly reliant on groundwater and their solutions under Sigma are gonna be critical for the implementation success. Urban utilities sometimes engage in consolidation uh, with these small uh, communities to bring them onto their system, but where that might not be a good idea, there are also opportunities for urban utilities to provide other administrative and technical assistance um, to, to help these uh, smaller communities resolve uh, supply issues moving forward. So the report also goes into detail about a number of recommendations that we have for local actors and for state agencies. And so I can summarize those very quickly right now. Uh, for urban utilities, uh, we think at least two things will be important. One is to continue to emphasize water use efficiency. As I mentioned, water use per capita in the Valley has been declining over the past decade or so. Uh, and it's important uh, to continue progress there, especially targeting um, high outdoor water use in the Southern portions of the Valley. Urban utilities should also advance allocations for groundwater and be cognizant of what their GSA is planning in terms of a ramp down schedule to bring the basin into balance. This will require coordination with other basin partners through the GSP um, and GSP action process. For land use authorities, um, one, one thing that will be really important is to promote water smart planning processes. And this could include not just thinking about how to manage land use for water efficiency at a local scale, but also thinking at the basin scale about to what extent urban development, which uses less water than agriculture, can play a role in help, helping to bring basins into balance. Second, they should work with urban utilities to identify areas that are very important for recharge and protect them from development, protect them from being paved over so that they can be available um, to recharge excess high flows or other surface water um, and help buffer groundwater levels. When it comes to state agencies, we have a number of recommendations and uh, this is just a selection here, but the first is that DWR should review 2020 urban water management plans with an eye towards Sigma implementation and the constraints that may be coming down the pipeline soon. In our review of 2015 plans, we found that in many cases, urban utilities projected large and sometimes implausibly large increases in groundwater availability as a new supply source. Furthermore, state agencies, and in this case, DWR and the state board should help to address capacity constraints for smaller urbans. In our work with smaller urbans for this report, we found that in some cases, they're capacity constrained and haven't really started planning for Sigma. This could put them behind and any support, perhaps planning grants from state agencies that could help them get up to speed on Sigma might bring big benefits. And finally, state agencies should also lean in and facilitate solutions for small communities. And in this case, we're thinking about the state water board, maybe with some support from DWR. Now, to be clear, they already, they already are um, in the sense that they've been helping to fund some consolidations of smaller communities with larger urban water systems in the Valley. But we think there's scope for more of that. And again, where a consolidation might not be the right answer, support for other administrative and technical assistance um, can go a long way. So with that, I will remind everyone that we're about to enter into a panel uh, moderated by my colleague, Ellen. And after that, there will be time for audience Q&A. Again, if you would like to submit questions for that Q&A session, you can do so at ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. So with that, 
I will stop sharing and I will invite Ellen in as the moderator of the panel. Ellen is a vice president and senior fellow uh, with PPIC and the director of the Water Policy Center. Um, so take it away, Ellen. Thank you, Andrew. That was a, a great overview and really teed up our panel discussion well. And so I'm super excited to invite the three panelists onto the stage now too, onto the virtual stage. Um, I'm gonna introduce them briefly. You can find more details uh, about their bios on our event page. So first here we have Raul Barraza Jr. who is general manager of the Arvin Community Services District. So that's serving the city of Arden which is down in Southern Kern County in the Kern Basin. Welcome Raul. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. Next we have Paul Goslin, who is the newly minted uh, Deputy Director for Sustainable Groundwater Management at the Department of Water Resources at the, for the state, statewide role, but he was wearing a local hat up in the Sac Valley for I think 13 years before that um, with, with, with Butte County. And so he's very familiar with Sigma also from the, from the local side. So we might get both, both perspectives from him a little bit today. Welcome, Paul. Welcome, glad to be here. And last but not least, we've got Luke Serpa, who is now city manager for the city of Clovis, the, um, the, the mid-sized city right near Fresno that, that you saw on the map a moment ago. And Luke um, is also, I mean, he, he, he is now city manager, which means he's got, he's got um, the, the land use side under him. He's got the, the, the water side under him and he's got a whole lot of other services under him too, but but before coming to city the city manager position, he was the head of the of the water um, department at at Clovis. So he's water is his first love. I'm going to say, Luke, right? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so um, without further ado, let's just get right into it. Um, we, you know, in, in in the report we talked about kind of a portfolio of solutions for communities um, on the, with some demand side solutions. There's already been progress made on the demand side, especially during the last drought. Um, with a lot of those savings that, you know, have kind of remained, I think at the time in 2015, when people, 2014, 15, people were really reducing water use, it wasn't clear whether those savings were gonna, gonna continue. And it looks like a lot of those savings have continued. And it looks like, um, you know, kind of the planning horizon for this that a, a lot of a lot of communities are expecting those those savings to to continue onward. So I just wanted to you know first ask Raul and Luke to just give a little insight on you know the prospect for demand management and what does that look like in your communities, um, and then and then also a little bit about the supply side solutions um, that, that you're looking at. And then we'll, we'll kind of move on to Paul to kind of get the, the perspective on, on, the, on the state's role there. So maybe starting with you, Raul, a little bit of sort of demand and supply side solutions. Right, I kind of like the picture that Dr. Ayers put up where it shows Clovis and Arvin. Uh, I like to say that Arvin is, if the Frying Current Canal was a sentence and we're the period right at the end, we're not a, uh, an agricultural district where we can bring water in, but that's definitely been a huge help for the community of Arvin as the city uh, and the water storage district have, you know, kind of joined together to uh, continue helping the community by bringing recharge water in. And so, you know, the, the, the residents here pay a property tax. And I think that, you know, kind of shows a collaboration that even though we're a community and we don't have any federal contracts for water, uh, being able to recharge water in certain locations that not only are going to be, uh, you know, good allocations for the, for the farmers, but it's also um, good for the community because we solely rely on that groundwater. And so Arvin Edison has done a great job where, uh, you know, they've been bringing recharge projects in since the early 1960s. And I think that's a, you know, it's a great example of what Sigma uh, could be and should be in, in, in the San Joaquin Valley. And, and Raul, how about on the demand management side? Is that sort of an area where, is that a relevant space for you, for you and your planning in, in Arvin? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, you hit it on the nose. Urban, especially, as, 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 you know, we have about 24,000 people here. So we're, we're literally a drop in the bucket in, in terms of how much water we utilize. But we definitely try to 
play our part in trying to conserve uh, the community in the, in the last drought, uh, was able to conserve up to 30% based on 2013 numbers. And we have seen a, a continued success of conservation in town. And so they're, they're able to keep those numbers down to where our gallons per, per capita are down about around 126. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really happy that our uh, folks understand the importance of water, what it means to the community, what it means to the valley economically, I believe. Um, but just in a sense that it's, it's, a, it's a resource that we need to survive. So, I mean, it's not like we could just continue to pump it until there's no more and go find something else. Uh, but the, the community has definitely uh, is a key player in making sure that this, this thrives and that it, we can continue the success of, of understanding conservation in a different way of life. I, I really think that it's time for us to look at the future a little bit differently of what we were used to. And, um, you know, I like green lawns, but hey, if we have to go away from that for, for a while, then that's something that, you know, that's a sacrifice we're willing to pay to continue having that influx of water come in and continue having the community that we have and thriving off of agriculture and just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's home. So you, you kind of want to keep it the same a little bit. Thank you. Luke, how about the picture from Clovis? So I think the demand management is uh, a lot easier on the new development. We have our water efficient landscape ordinance. Um, it allows, you know, it requires all new landscaping to go in in a water efficient manner and limit the water use for outside landscaping. I think the, the challenge is to try to go back and reduce the water use in the 30 or 40,000 residences that are already existing in Clovis, not to mention schools and such. Uh, it, it's very costly to replace landscaping, you know, that, that, you know, we developed with a lot of detached single family residences with relatively large lots. And it's expensive to go back and re-landscape those lots to reduce the water use. And because of the way the rate structure is set up, you'll never really recover your costs in, in water savings. Uh, you know, you can spend $20,000 to re-landscape your, your lot and you're gonna save two or $300 a year. That's never gonna pencil out. So that's gonna be a challenge going forward. We're looking at some options for that. You know, there's the, just the public pressure and, and constant reminder of, that people need to conserve. But when it comes down to the dollar and cents, that's going to be a challenge. But we're, we're still working on that. Going forward, we've got a handle on it with the water efficient landscape ordinance. On the supply side, uh, I think something the report talks about and something that I can't cannot overemphasize is uh, you have to look very long term. Uh, as a city, we, we're fortunate. We, you know, we control our land use and our water side. So we need to look beyond our urban water management plan. And when we're planning, when we update our general plans, um, we actually start looking at updating our water portfolio to full build out of our general plan. Uh, and, and what can we do, not, not to meet the next five years, not the 10 years, not 20 years, but 80 years out until the city is completely developed. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the Valley. Um, and, and we started doing that a while back. We actually started shifting off of groundwater to surface water uh, 10 years before uh, Sigma was adopted. Um, and we're just accelerating that process and then looking out for future surface water supplies. And we're already entering into uh, partnerships with our local irrigation district um, to expand our water supply. And really we're buying water that we may not need for 40 years, but it's, uh, it's expensive now, but it's, it's just gonna be more expensive 40 years from now. And if we know we're gonna need it, we need to start locking that in before we get to that point. Great, well, thank you. And so, so this is a, a good moment to segue over to Paul. I mean, here we've got Paul, a, a couple of examples of communities that are, are partnering with, mm -hmm with the, the, the neighboring ag districts. Um, and that's really making a difference for them on, on the supply side of their portfolio. Um, that's, you know, they're not the only examples of partnerships in the Valley, but, um, you know, we're suggesting that more, more of the, these kind of partnerships are gonna be necessary. And, and that maybe, you know, especially some of the smaller urban um, agencies are gonna, might need help with that. Um, so just, Kind of wondering, you know, from the perspective, wearing your wearing your new DWR hat, you know, <laughs> what what can you guys do to help um, with that? But then also, you know, other thoughts you might have to share about 
kind of how communities can can develop their portfolios. Yeah, thank you. Um, excellent presentations on um, what's going on down in the valley. And, and I think taking a step back from what the promise of Sigma was about was about local management uh, within the basins. And so I'll, I'll go back to my experience in the Sac Valley. When Sigma came out, it really became apparent this wasn't just the job of the county or a district, or it was just solutions weren't gonna be just born by agriculture. It was gonna take the entire community uh, to work together. Um, you know, everyone had to be at the table. Um, and I think really, regardless of how much water they uh, have on demand and what their portfolio is, there's a lot of creativity and solutions that can be brought to the table by having all the uh, entities there. So um, it really became a good process to have the uh, urban municipalities talk to agriculture, the county um, on long-term solutions through, uh, through Sigma and the groundwater sustainability plans. So putting the DWR hat on, uh, what we bring to the table and something I go back to my um, days of Butte County was technical support services uh, was real key uh, to advancing and developing plans. The support to have a structured dialogue, especially with urban uh, water management planners or urban purveyors and ag uh, users who may not have talked before, understand how we operate, getting them at the table was uh, real important, and then the governance structure uh, to make sure those were all set up was was really important. So those services are there, as well as having the ability to fund uh, some of the solutions. Um, we're having a lot of creative, good solutions coming up through the groundwater sustainability plans. Uh, we've put out um, almost two hundred million dollars so far on uh, GSP um development and we've just had in this past budget signed by governor newsom 300 million dollars for gsp implementation over the next three years so we're really looking to help uh advance some of the solutions we're finding um uh, locally we're trying to also improve the tools that we have available for people to look at um and to work through whether it's um uh, water accounting to help advance those basins that have chosen have chosen to uh, look at water allocations or water markets to to help advance that as well as uh, general groundwater data and you'll look later um, um, when we release what was called Bolton 118 California groundwater it will have a, a groundwater live aspect that will be a, a really good tool for people um, to look at and then. I think transition long-term, we're looking to work uh, with local communities and GSAs as they transition uh, and develop their uh, plans and implement um, those solutions. Some of them are gonna be very tough. It's gonna, um, I think, have a lot of community dialogue about um, how we're gonna work through the um, balancing the basin and keep communities viable, the economy going and agriculture going. and um, that's going to take a lot of work at the local level. We're looking at uh, to bring some of the tools and opportunities from the state down to help local communities make those uh, transitions over the next 20 years. Thank you, Paul. So let, let's talk a little bit more about partnerships now, including sort of the, the links between water and land use. Um, you know, we, we talk a little bit in the report about, you know, opportunities for you know, California law already requires a certain amount of that, right? I mean, if if you have a large development, uh, you can't actually build unless you um, show that you've got some long a long term reliable water supply available. Um, so, and that's been in place for about to, almost twenty years now. Um, and then with Sigma, there's some new requirements to kind of you know connect the the new groundwater planning processes with with the general planning processes and, 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 and sort of what's going on at the, at the, at the local level on, uh, in, in, urban, in urban communities. But um, you know, we talked about a little bit in the report that there are opportunities on the sort of demand management side to think about uh, you know, kind of smart land use can be good for smart water use on the, and then also um, on the supply side that, kind of planning for make, making sure you're not paving stuff over that you're going to regret later. 
uh, basically, be, because it would be good for recharge. So um, we've got kind of an interesting combination here be, with Raul and Luke representing different kind of structures. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to kind of get your insights on this. Um, Raul is manager of a special district that delivers water to the community of Arvin, but but he, he does not oversee the land use side of things, right? Um, so that, that's in the city of Arvin. So that's a, a little bit of a different situation from where Luke is, where, you know, full service city and um, the, the land use, in principle, the land use uh, and, the, and the water folks, they're all, they all, they all are under the, under the, the city manager and the city council, right? So right. Um, just kind of a little bit of insights from you all on how that integration is working. Are there ways that you'd like to see it more integrated and, you know, opportunities for that? Maybe Raul, we'll start with you. No, we, we have a great relationship with the city. I think there's a mutual understanding that we service the same population and there's no need to have any bickering back and forth. And so, you know, we're, we're dealing with general funds and I really like to take that super serious um, and focus uh, our projects for the community. And so, um, you know, we were looking for a well site. The city was uh, had some some land. They sold it to us. It didn't work out uh, once we did the test, the test well and they're going through some housing stuff and so we went ahead and sell, sold it back so you know it's it's a partnership definitely that we're always looking to to have um it's it's a little bit different for us i don't think we have any big uh highways that drive near us so really trying to pull businesses into the city is is a little tough so we really haven't seen a lot of that whole demand supply um other than what we know historically we're going to need for the population here um, but I think, you know, bigger cities, obviously, they're always trying to um, generate different revenue. I think all cities are. Um, but obviously, them having some big arteries that go into the city, that, that's a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more access for, you know, transportation to bring in whatever products or whatever services that they can provide from there. So a little bit of a different scope. Uh, we're kind of hidden. Um, I think for Clovis, it's probably um, a little bit more you know, in sense, uh, in sense of, of understanding their water supply and their demand and, and, and uh, having some of those studies done before they actually start that development. Thank you. So yeah, so Luke, let's, let's hear a little bit more about that. So yeah, we, we are fully integrated. Uh, we, you know, one thing, moving from the water side of the operation to the city manager side, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, the need for water conservation and all that, but I also am much more aware in this position of the the state's mandates that we build housing you know we have our regional housing need allocation and we are allocated a certain uh number of houses we're supposed to build over a few year period and uh we need to zone for that and provide for it and um, that's a challenge right now we're fast growing and even as fast growing as clovis is we're not meeting our regional housing needs allocation we are not building as many houses as the state thinks we we should be um so uh, you, you know, we can't slow down the growth um, to, to manage demand. We need, we need to, you know, plan the supplies to meet that growth. And being a city, a full service city does make it easier. We, uh, like I said, when, when we're working on our general plan, we're also updating our utility master plans uh, to serve the new general plan. And part of that utility master plan is where we're going to get that water from. Uh, we do look for uh, opportunities for recharge. Uh, unfortunately, where we're located uh, to the west of us and south of us is Fresno. Uh, north and east of us, we're butting up against the foothills and, and we start to run out of good geology for percolation. So uh, we don't have a lot of areas that we're protecting. We have some established percolation basins and recharge basins here within the city already, but in our new growth area to the north and to the east, there's really not a lot of opportunities. So we're partnering with uh, the local irrigation districts. And I think, you know, it, it truly is a partnership. And, and we have, um, uh, you know, we bring some stuff to the table and they have water and, and we work out a mutual agreement where hopefully it's beneficial for both agencies. You know, one thing we don't want this to turn into is an urban versus ag issue. It's, it's we're all in this together. We're all in the valley together. Our economies are based on the ag. Um, so the cooperation just is is paramount to our success going forward. Thank you. So so Paul, love you to weigh in from a yeah. state 
uh, or Sac Valley or both perspectives. Yeah, and I, I think what um, was just described Raul and Luke's description of the integration between water supply planning, um, Sigma planning and land use is exactly what um, should be going on. Uh, Sigma did, when it was put in, did add in that relationship, communication between the Groundwater Sustainability Agency and the land use agencies on the groundwater sustainability plans and land use decisions, and which is a very important element, but just putting words into the law doesn't make it happen. And so I think there's a lot more work uh, that's gonna have to be done um, to increase that communication uh, between the land use agencies and groundwater sustainability agencies as things change over the next 20 years, which they inevitably will with housing demand, um, climate change is going to change some of the dynamics and availability of water. And that close communication between uh, the agencies on planning is gonna be paramount to making sure that uh, wise decisions are made and, and communities can um, advance and, and move forward. So uh, it's a very critical element because culture, there's different terminologies, there's different approaches. And so I think there's uh, looking at some education and forums to help advance that uh, over time. Is, is there, is that a space that where DWR can also kind of help to, to move things forward? I'm wondering, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you, you got, as you described, you're very present in helping with Sigma implementation. And oh. I know folks around the state have appreciated planning grants and now implementation grants. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. This is going to be one of the things we're going to talk to our other state agency partners and with local agencies and the um, city and county associations on, on doing that. I, I think people recognize that um, this is something we can continue to advance and try to do some educational forums and keep the communication going. I think the point we're at now, everyone has submitted their plans in as a starting point. And it's not the end of implementation, it's just the beginning. So there's a lot of work ahead. So there's a lot of opportunity to continue the collaboration and partnerships locally, uh, learn from each other as to what communities need, what water is available, um, and, and try to work out those solutions locally. And we're gonna be here to help uh, communities through those transitions. Great, thank you. So we have a, a little bit of time before we're gonna switch over to audience Q&A. So I wanted us to, to spend a moment talking about kind of the water quality piece of things um, in, in the Valley, you know, so th this is the, as, as, as we know, and you know, this has been kind of elevated to, to to, in importance as a as a state priority, and it's been a, an area where um, there's been a lot of very effective advocacy on the on the part of um, communities. That California has a number of of smaller communities, especially um, that don't have uh, that, that have water quality problems um, in terms of of having challenges meeting meeting maximum contaminant limits on, on different kinds of contaminants. That's especially an issue with groundwater because a lot of communities were able to develop, you don't actually, if groundwater is healthy or is safe, you don't need to have as much treatment infrastructure and everything. So it's easier to develop uh, on groundwater. Um, but now that you know, we're, we're recognizing sort of some of the stuff that's in that groundwater, we're having to, to to rethink that strategy and, and and look for solutions to make sure that communities have safe water. And I know, you know this is an issue that Raul um, in, in his community has been uh, fa facing that challenge as, as an urban provider, but a, not a big one, right? So not able to, to kind of have the scale economies for that. And it's definitely a problem in many of the smaller communities that are you know much smaller than, 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 than Arvin. Um, <laughs> So wanted us to talk a little bit about opportunities that Sigma presents, I guess, for helping to, to tackle this. And, and Raul, you, you had some interesting things when we talked the other day to share about thinking about the partnerships on recharge and how that might help. Uh, so wanted to start with you on this. Yeah, just, uh, you, you know, in, in, in talking about the recharge projects that Arvin Edison brings into the Valley, we have uh, most of our wells on the south side of, of town and so just because of the way that geography works um, and the topography kind of takes the water down that way, 
even through the entire Sigma process where um, Arvin Edison was having to do studies on groundwater and elevations and where everything was at, we kind of figured that that's a really good area for us to continue drilling to find better quality water. And we wanna make the connection between uh, water imports and every time that there are um, you know, water recharge projects and to see how long it would take to lower the arsenic levels in some of our wells, because we've noticed that in the past, obviously there hasn't been like a formal partnership with us in Arvin Edison, um, even though we work closely, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't share a, a lot of those numbers and dates. And so that's one of the things that we really wanna work on is to see if, you know, how, how, how can it help our area? Because with groundwater, there, it's not an exact science, right? It's always like a science experiment. Every time you drill a well, it's, it's, it has its, its own personality. And so you're gonna be dealing with different issues. Um, and you know, that, that's kind of one of the, the things that we look at is, can we, can we make that connection between water importation and, and the quality, water quality that we have in the community? Great, thank you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to the others, but I, before that, I just wanna remind you all that in the audience, if you wanna send questions to the panel, um, it is this email, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. So send them along. So I just open it up to, you know, Paul or Luke, uh, if you have things to say about, you know, kind of uh, opportunities for moving forward on, on, on tackling some of the safe drinking water issues in the Valley. Yeah, I'll jump in. Raul had a real good um, example of multi benefit type projects that can result from good collaboration and partnerships that may not have happened, um, you know, before, before Sigurd, that, that might have, but I think it's spurring some of these um, creative solutions to deal with water quality issues, but also groundwater sustainability issues. Um, and again, the state, we're looking to help um, support through funding uh, for small community systems um, and, and also with projects that implement um, the groundwater sustainability plan. So um, multi-benefit projects will be um, uh, real good, I think, to advance some of the problems facing communities. Thank you. So I think we are gonna, I'm getting questions already popping up here in on my screen. So I think, I think we're gonna maybe invite um, Andrew back to the stage to, to also be available for the, for the panel discussion. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna get right into it. Um, again, uh, if you've got questions, don't hold back um, and please say who you are when you send your question because we'd like to acknowledge you. PPIC event questions at gmail.com. And I'm gonna kick right in with this one from William Pedler of Real-Time Aquifer Services. Um, who, who wants to talk more about, about recharge issues. He said, what he, what he says, one of the biggest challenges to Sigma is effectively getting more surface water into viable places in the ground. Um, so we'd love panelists to speak about specific methods and case studies around how best to do this. Um, and so invite that to whoever would like to jump in on that. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. We, we operate our own recharge basins. We have, you know, we years, decades ago, we identified some land that was uh, uh, suitable and, and for fast recharge. Uh, so we operate our own recharge basins. But like I said earlier, we don't have a lot of other places where we could put additional recharge. So we've partnered with uh, the irrigation district basically on water banking facilities where, you know, we fund a banking facility uh, south and west of, of town. And um, when we need to call on that water, it's really an exchange. They will provide water to one of their ag users from that basin and provide us more surface water upstream off the Kings. Um, so those type of banking facilities, even if they're not located in your city can, can, can benefit. Um, we've looked at some ways to improve percolation in our basins. Uh, we're studying some different methods mixed success on those, uh, you know, we're even looking far enough ahead uh, to look at du uh, direct aquifer uh, storage and recovery, where it, you know, we have a surface water treatment plant and during the winter, it's idling along at a small fraction of its capacity. Uh, right now it's cost prohibitive, but in the future, it may be worthwhile for us to treat 
uh, stormwater runoff and then direct uh, inject it into the aquifer because once it's treated, it's safe for injection. Uh, it's a costly process now, but down the line, it, it may pay, it may be worthwhile. So we're looking out, out forward at things like that too. Great, thanks. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I was, I was going to say from DWR's perspective, we're really trying to advance uh, Floodmar uh, projects. A lot of uh, local agencies have put those types of projects into their plans. Uh, so there's a lot of data and support um, to, to advance that. We're also um, uh, initiating a uh, project throughout the state to map the geologic architecture using uh, geophysics. You might have seen the helicopter uh, flying the AEM project. So the budget included money for us to go map uh, essentially the entire valley. And that's going to be an important foundation for looking at recharge projects and, and other types of water management projects um, throughout the valley. Great. Thank you. Um, so next question, this is kind of pivoting over to the, the land use side of this recharge question, which, you know, recharge, I'll just say, in all of the, the plans that we looked at for the San Joaquin Valley, recharge is like, you know, the number one thing that folks have been emphasizing. So this, th these questions very much fit with, fit with that interest. So Laura Stokes is wondering, about the housing side of this, what to do when new housing developments are planned for prime groundwater recharge areas? Are there ways to prevent such projects from moving forward? And, you know, I don't know, I'm, I, from what you, both Raul and Luke have talked about, my sense is that you, that's not a, a burning issue right under your feet, but um, you, you might have uh, insights you know, from, from what you've seen happening in, in, in neighboring areas too. So, um, you know, just welcome your thoughts about that, you know, in terms of, I, I, like, I, I know in neighboring Fresno that, that people sort of look back on some parking lots and with, with you know, in, in a wistful way um, right now, Luke. So, you know, I'm wondering if I can put you on the spot to, to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the broader area that you live in and how this issue is handled. Yeah, I think it, it, it is a challenge. Um, I, I think if you let it wait until you get to the point of uh, approving or not approving a subdivision, it's really too late. Uh, you need to get out ahead of it. Uh, you know, Clovis, like I said, we don't, we don't have a lot of good recharge areas left, uh, but it's not for a lack of looking. And we were out uh, running test holes and boreholes and percolation tests in large pieces of property uh, before they ever got sold to a developer. And um, had they been worthwhile, uh, the city would have bought them um, just to use as recharge before it ever gets to the point of a developer investing in it and then coming in with his tentative map. Because once you get to that point, once, once someone has made an investment on the property uh, to develop it, it, then it becomes a lot harder to go in and tell them, oh, you can't develop it because it's, uh, it's, it's going to be recharged. I think you got to get way out ahead of it and start identifying those pieces of property. We can never do anything about the ones we missed going back, but get out ahead of it going forward and, and, and lock those pieces of property up before they ever get sold for development. So long-term vision and planning ahead and, yeah. and prep work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'd, I'd add to that too. I think in general plan updates, um, you know, some of those considerations building into general plans could be important, such as permeable surfaces and, and even design on um, how much rain capture could be occurring in areas that may have uh, high permeability. So um, there are things that, I think could be, as Luke said, built in up front so developers would know when they go into an area how to do best practices to um, promote recharge in, in building designs. Great, thanks. And I, Raul, I, you know, I, I know that for, in, your, in your case, you know, there have been discussions sort of with the, with the city around the sort of recharge of, of highly treated wastewater and things too. Is, are there are there land use decisions that come into play there, or is that kind of already you know already set up in a good in a good way? I wonder if there are any insights from from what what's happening in in the area there. Yeah, that that's uh 
you know, the city just uh, signed a new contract with the farmer. They, I think they rent out the land so that the farmer can take the water. They use it for uh, plants, not, not consumable by humans. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's a way for them to kind of get rid of their wastewater. But at the end of the day, it's still, it's still a percolation that we're getting um, into the ground. Uh, and, you know, they're thinking about making a tertiary plant, which would definitely change the game as you can use some of that water for irrigation of parks and, and uh, uh, center mediums. And so, you know, it, it, it depends on, on what their case study is going to, is going to find and, and whether or not they're going to move forward with it. But obviously we, we let them know that that's a, a positive for us in, in regards to water credits. If we ever do go to a water exchange market, then, you know, that's definitely a positive for us. And that highlights kind of to the, you know, the thing about the land use can also be about thinking about how to, how to, how to use existing ag land um, as part of the, part of the solution set Correct. for, for this. So um, I gotta make a choice here on my next question. All right. I think I'm going to go first with this one, which is from Michelle at the state water board. Um, and I, I don't have her last name here and I want to say it's Frederick or Fredrickson. I'm not sure. Sorry, Michelle, for not getting it completely right. But this is the, the person who spends a lot of her time working on consolidations. Um, and, uh, you know, where this, this has been a priority area for, for thinking about um, solutions for communities that currently don't have small, small systems that currently don't have safe drinking water or that just are, you know, one well, one well failure away from, uh, having an outage, that kind of thing, and and I know you know this has been a, a, a an, in the Fresno area, sort of right right next door to to Luke. There's been some effort to kind of look at look at the scope for some consolidations there. And so um, Michelle is asking, um, how could the state water board best integrate uh, the need for land use development, but also decrease unsustainable systems, um, and how to how to best coordinate between with, with city and county planning on this because the concern is that often the small communities the very small communities uh and the new ones uh you know there's a desire sometimes to build new ones on the outskirts of cities and outside of lapco boundaries so i don't know you know who would who would like to weigh in on that if we have any insights for her um luke you're smiling yeah so that's kind of a you, you know the Development that occurs in Clovis, you know, we're providing the water for. We've got, we, we're fortunate, we're a large enough system that we can overcome, uh, you know, quality issues, quantity issues. Uh, the question of how do you, you've got existing small systems out there that are outside of city limit that are, um, some of them because of their location are viable for consolidation with a, a larger system like ours. Uh, Money becomes a hurdle there because there's a lot of infrastructure involved. If we're going to take in a district that is outside of our city, then that district is going to have to pay uh, to get the pipes there and basically buy into their share of our water treatment plant and our water supply portfolio or bring a water supply with them. Um, and uh, that's a that's a big financial burden in the city of Clovis, all those costs are paid up front through development impact fees for the existing users, but for bringing in somebody else that's already developed, it's, it's, it's a big burden. So the state, I know they have funding um, uh, for disadvantages communities mostly, but also we recently just got involved with some negotiations for a, a not disadvantaged community being consolidated with ours. And there's, it's gonna be a big upfront cost for that district. Um, we're not going to burden our users, our, our rate payers with that cost. So they're going to have to find some funding for it, but it's, it's a possibility. The idea of, you know, new development going in, that's going to end up being a problem down the road. There you get into like some tax sharing issues between the county and the, Fres and the you know, the county and the cities. And, um, you know, the county, obviously they, they're looking for property tax and, uh, uh, permitting a development is is a benefit to them. Um, it's just okay down the road. Is that one going to be able to stand on its own, or are they going to need to eventually be seeking consolidation? So uh, that that's kind of a bigger issue or a separate issue. Uh, again, one that's kind of separate from the water world, but one that I get involved with in my in my current role as the capture agreements. Yeah, 
Great. Okay, thanks. So I'm, I'm, this next question I'm going to put to Andrew. Um, it's a question from Jim Hallway, um, who's the director of the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy, which is actually one of our partners um, on, on this research. And a, a couple of uh, researchers on, on Jim's team are, are co-authors on, on the project. And Jim had a two-part question. I feel like we've answered the first part of that, which is, um, you know, the, the, basically the, the, the frame that these are not only California issues. These are issues that are, you know, communities out across the West are facing. And he was kind of wondering both, are there lessons from California that others should look to? And I think I think both Raul and Luke and, and, and Paul have, have already kind of teed some of those up in terms of some of the, the creative partnerships. But he also asked any any particular lessons from Cal from elsewhere that would be useful for California. And we talk about this some in the report, but uh, so Andrew didn't have a ch chance to, to highlight that. So just a, a, a couple top top line insights, Andrew, would be really great to share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that's spot on. These are not just California issues. Um, and I, I'll just give a couple a couple sort of teasers of some of these lessons from elsewhere that um, that we go into in the report. Um, one of those is, you know, Luke mentioned a moment ago, development impact fees. Um, those are not unique to California. Their uh, development impact fees are a normal a normal thing for uh, utilities to use. <clears throat> excuse me to help shore up supplies uh, for new developments elsewhere in the West. And looking across the West, we found that there was quite a bit of variation in how development impact fees were structured um, uh, for new development in in different locations. And so there are probably some lessons to be learned there. Um, about how to structure them well and how to structure them in a way that, you know, in some cases that might be structuring them so that the new development has to pay for new supply. In other cases, they might be specifically structured where the development impact fee can help fund efficiencies in existing uh, development within the community and free up water that way. Um, so one, high level development impact fees. Um, and two was other, other examples of uh, sort of innovative water trading um, activities that uh, have helped to free up water um, out of, in some cases, flexibly out of agriculture uh, to help fund new development in urban areas. Um, and yeah, so there are other examples of that elsewhere that we describe in the report a little bit. Terrific. All right. So we are, we are getting close to, to time here. And I, I think it, um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, go to any more audience questions now. I'm just going to it, it kind of tee up one lightning round question for you all um, before we say goodbye. And this is so you know you have 30, 45 seconds to answer this. And it's kind of looking ahead when it comes to implementing Sigma in the San Joaquin Valley. What's your worst fear and what's your greatest hope? And I want to start with Raul. I guess um, one of the biggest things that we hear all the time, human right to water, obviously without water, we die. Um, but I, I think that it, it is important to understand that there is a cost to water, especially when we're pumping uh, you know, groundwater and we have to either uh, put some kind of filtration or something to it. So in a sense, the state does uh, a great job in helping out all these disadvantaged communities. And I think that kind of is gonna set the, set the bar a little bit more even in the sense of understanding where they're at and water quality and, and, and the water resilience for their future and their communities. But definitely if, if we have to take something from this is everybody needs to start communicating, county, cities, it's just, uh, it's, it's, everybody's gonna be affected. So we all need to pitch in. Thank you. And Luke, how about you? Uh, so I think really one of the very commendable things about Sigma is the local control aspect of it. Um, the way it allows us to form partnerships. So I, I think, you know, my, my greatest hope is that, you know, we're all going to continue cooperating and collaborating and get through this together it, within our various GSAs. Uh, I think that's, that's the only way forward that really works well for all of us. Uh, you know, my biggest fear is that you're going to get, uh, you know, a bad player here or there that tries to blow the whole thing up and, and, and we lose that local control. I think as long as we can keep collaborating and cooperating that it's gonna be a success. Great, okay, Paul, 30 seconds. Yeah, and I just echo those uh, fears and, and hopes. And um, my hope is that we, we continue on this partnership for the 20 year journey to bring sustainability to the basin in a way that 
keeps communities, agriculture, and the environment uh, viable for the long haul. Thank you. Amen. Um, so with that, I want to thank Andrew for that great presentation. And I want to thank Raul, Luke, and Paul for being awesome panelists. And thank you, the audience, for joining us. Um, this is going to be available as a video to, to watch later and to share. Um, and if you pre-registered for this event, you're going to receive a survey. Please fill it out if you can. Take a couple minutes and tell us how we did. That's helpful. And stay tuned. Keep an eye out for an announcement about our annual fall water conference, um, Seizing the Drought, Water Priorities for a Changing Climate. We're going to have three sessions over three days. November 15th, 16th, and 17th with another great lineup of panelists. Um, so look forward to seeing you there and take care, be safe, and have a great afternoon. <laughs>